So thank you very much to the organizers, Nesca. I let you contact me and the thinking about me to give a bit of a perspective on a let's say, different uh, point of view of galaxy evolution. And yes, the title is about the main sequence, and there will be a lot of main sequence. Uh, we're going to tell you what it is too. But uh, I got uh, pretty much excited when I was reading materials to put together this lecture, and so I thought it would be a little bit more of a uh, broader view of galaxy evolution, starting from uh, phenomenology, so observations mostly. And since it's a three hour uh, lecture, it's going to be just elements of it, of course. So I'll try to give you a flavor of what we can do, of what's currently debated uh, about galaxy evolution from an observation perspective. Um, yes, okay. So what can you what can you expect from this contribution? So let me just briefly introduce myself first. Um, I am uh, uh, an astronomer, mostly more than a business problem. I really love observations, so that's gonna be my point of view. Um, I'm Italian, I'm from a small town in the North of Italy, but I studied in Padua, uh, close to Venice, and uh, that's where I started my journey about galaxy evolution, mass size of quiescent uh, galaxies. And I had my PhD in Sacre, uh, but also doing the actives, uh, studying environmental effects of galaxy evolution, so how the surrounding environment and density affects the properties of galaxies at high redshift. And then I went to Copenhagen uh, at the Nitzbor Institute, uh, the Dark Cosmology Center first, and then the Cosmic Dawn Center, uh, where I'm currently employed as an assistant professor, but I'm going to be moving soon to Germany, to Eastern on December 2022, so coming back south again. And as I said, I'm a third, and my idea is to try to put things together, so that's why I try to develop this sort of with the wavelength approach, so observing galaxies from short wavelengths, let's say as short as optical to long wavelengths, uh, sub-millimeter to radio, to try to cover as much as possible the phenomena regulating the growth, the formation and growth and depth of galaxies. So here you have some stuff information on the left. This is maybe an updated picture from HSC. There's going to be some crazy new ones from the MSP at some point. Uh, then you have something in the middle, uh, the voidness effect of the AGM in, uh, in the core of galaxies, and then a picture that you saw in the previous presentation, uh, the remnants of a uh, quiescent uh, elliptical galaxy, which is not that elliptical when you look faintly enough in the outskirts. So this should be roughly the evolution of a galaxy, forming stars, something happens, maybe connected with the AGM, and then they die. And this is what I'm going to try to encapsulate in the three hours that I, uh, I'm going to uh, present this lecture. So this is my perspective. Uh, I'll try to give you some context and some open questions. Uh, being an observer, uh, you, you learn pretty quickly that selection effects and biases are at least half of your research time. And so please keep that in mind. I come with my own biases, with my own views. I have my favorite solutions to certain problems. They're not the only ones. So you're very welcome to let me know what your favorite solution is. Raise your hand and ask questions even during the during the presentation. If it's less of a monologue and more of a discussion, maybe it's a little bit more fun for the audience. OK, so what we talk about when we talk about galaxies, uh, my historical perspective is going to be probably Three slides. The first one is how we thought uh, the Milky Way looked like. This is the 1700 from William Herschel. And I think it's pretty obvious that we took quite some big steps from there. But it was the first time that we started to think about, at least in the modern era, about other galaxies, our galaxies and other galaxies um, outside the Milky Way. But then it was really only roughly a hundred years ago, and if you think about it, the human time scale is not that much that we realize that galaxies exist outside the Milky Way. The Milky Way is just one galaxy. So these are some templates on which uh, Hubble was uh, was working on in the 1920s, and they were just showing the gorgeous variety of shapes of this nebula at that point. We're still calling that, and they realized that there were other than the Milky Way with the by measuring the density of the sea phase that we heard from uh, 
uh, from uh, Germany. And from there on, let's say the next galactic astrophysics started its, its journey. And of course, the first thing that an uh, astronomer would do, probably any human being would do, when they start seeing different shapes of different things, they start to make some sense of it, some, to put some classification, some categories. And the easiest thing to do is to look at the shapes, so the morphology. And this is the very famous Green Court diagram. Uh, this is the version, I think it was the original one, it's published uh, in the Atlas of uh, Nebula by, by Hubble, uh, identifying something which looks like a spheroid or a cigar, maybe, or uh, a rounded shape, but what they were called elliptical galaxies or early type galaxies. And then there was this branch with galaxies that look instead more like this. And uh, these are late type galaxies, and it's kind of interesting to keep this in mind because, as you might know, the original classification with early and late implies some sort of time evolution, which actually turned out to be pretty much the opposite than, uh, than what was originally proposed. So early type is something that looks like a football, and late type is something that looks more like this, possibly with spiral arms and wires and structure. In it. Well, this is a jump a hundred years later, and I think we made it to the point that the real images are as close as possible to what we thought were simulated galaxies. So on the left, we have simulations of disky type galaxies from the fire uh, simulations, and on the right, you have a real image, a three color image, which you have to see in the core of a nearby galaxy. Where the first time I saw this image on the right, and you see that in the center there's a little bit of a dip. I thought that, you know, we put together the picture, just remove the central part just to show us what's in there. Um, no, that's how the image looks like. And if you look at the cores of some of those simulations, you actually see some similar sky. So it's a great time to be alive, to be an astronomer, an observer, a theoretician. So I think uh, a lot of great things are going to happen in the next few years. JWST is part of the reasons. There's a plethora of very good instruments and telescopes that we can use to try really to go deep into the properties of galaxies, and this is just an example. Another example that I really like is this one. Uh, we were talking about this over lunch, so I just had this slide on the fly. This is an image of one of the early release objects in JWSTs in the cluster, and you can see the, um, the effect of the gravitational lensing on these galaxies here, and we heard about shapes and how you can actually figure out if this is a these are mergers, and these are like uh, rotating disks, but you know, your typical the compositions for galaxies like this one or this one are going to be pretty problematic. But we do have already the first papers that we'll put out on the archive on this. So if you Google it, last week people took these images and tried to perform something like what Jeremy was mentioning, gene coefficients, asymmetry, et cetera, et cetera, on the new, in the new images. And I just highlighted this one here because there are two blips here and then now I can't see because they're very red, probably. Uh, well, they're somewhere here. I think it's this one and this one. And those things are two spectroscopic for the rest of 7.6 galaxy that are just, that happens to be 50 kiloparsec far away. And you have this set, set of emission lines that you're typically used to see in SDSS maybe, but now you can do it in rest of 7, which is, I think, my goal. Anyway, pretty pictures. Uh, I thought that the first part of this uh, presentation could have been a bit more about the physics and the observations. I hope that this intercepts both the audience that is really into cosmology and math, and also uh, people who are more into observations. But please let me know if it's, you know, it can be adjusted. So I can go faster on a few things and slower on a few others. And in order for me to have an idea, I would just like to your question and wants to see if you're, you know, if you're back from lunch. The first question is how many of you identify themselves as researchers in galaxy evolution more than cosmology? So please raise your hand. If you're interested in galaxy properties. Okay, well, I'm, I'm happy with that. And the second question is like how many of you work directly with data, like meaning galaxy images and galaxy spectrum? Okay. All right, great. And I hope you will be fine. So 
the first thing I would like to remind everyone here is that basically the whole whole information that we have from galaxies, especially a little further than 0 0.00 something in Russia, is from light. And light is free. And basically the work of the observer is to take this light and try to um, understand how the, the light is distributed in a big parameter space, which includes frequency, it includes color, it includes well, energy, of course, is connected. It, it could be just the distribution of the sky and so on and so forth. So that's basically what an observational astronomer does. And I'd like just to start with a pretty picture here, another one. Uh, this is from a museum in Copenhagen called Louisiana. And this is uh, an infinity room. Uh, it's a gorgeous piece. And actually, this is always reminding me a little bit of being inside the one, see? And instead, just in a room of a few cubic uh, meters. But when you're inside, basically you figure out that's exactly what an astronomer will do, is just to start to categorize the things around here. I mean, you have detailed shapes, you have spatial distribution, you see that it's not homogeneous all over the place, there are different colors. Absence of light is actually information. So you can figure out that there are people here just because you don't see, uh, you don't see the light of the bulbs. And it's actually the exact same when you look at galaxies and when you look at observers and you look at dust and you know your optical light disappears. So that's exactly what uh, we typically do. And then I'll just quickly jump into a few of these properties. But first, just a quick reminder that depending on what you're looking at, depending on what light you're collecting, you get different properties of light. You see, so you go from very uh, uh, long wavelengths uh, with the radio up to gamma rays, and this is like a nearby, uh, nearby object, and you see that each of these uh, probes is actually telling you something about a specific part, a specific component of galaxies, and whatever it meets in that, at that uh, specific wavelength, then it's going to be shining or, uh, or being absorbed at other wavelengths. So here you have radio, where you can see it gas at the center there is a strong AGN which is emitting jets you can see it then you have the infrared which is the real dust and then you go to something which is a little bit more typical for, for uh, our own experience the optical and ultraviolet you start going into the high energy regime and at the center you do see the x-ray emission from, from black hole so this is one first biases to keep in mind and this is the translation into, uh, let's say, a 1D. So now we are spanning the parameter space of the wavelengths, or we can see the other amount of energy. And basically, here we're trying to figure out how the energy emitted by a galaxy is distributed in the space. I think you have already a workshop about SC modeling, so I'll just recall a few things. But uh, this is one of the basic tools we have. Uh, in, in astronomy to figure out what a galaxy is composed of and what it's doing. And keep in mind also that photometry and spectroscopy, they're not conceptually or radically different. Spectroscopy is just telling you the information at a much finer grade. Yeah, grade. So it's telling you how the energy is distributed over small wavelength spots. While the SED in general, what we call photometry, is actually trying to sample this emission at some, uh, at some uh, course of wavelengths or frequencies. I will mostly speak about, uh, talk about two properties uh, connected to the, this energy distribution, uh, at least uh, for what concerns this part. Uh, the first one is the stellar mass. Stellar mass, keep in mind, is dominated by all the stars, stars that tend to be red and show up, especially in the infrared and the optical part, uh, somewhere around here, at this wavelength, uh, let's say one micron. And then you have star formation rate, which is instead the rate at which new stars are formed per year by a galaxy. And we quickly realized that counting new stars, it becomes unfeasible, uh, even in the nearby. So we have to re rely on um, the effect of the new stars on the, uh, let's say, the surrounding regions. And so we do have different tracers of star formation rate. And the uh, classical one is uh, ionized. Um, gas from H2 regions, so the gas which is surrounding the new star, which is ionized by the strong radiation, typically young massive blue stars, let's say both stars. And then we have uh, dust, which is produced uh, most likely by stars, and then is heated by the UV emission of stars. So if you know how much energy is absorbed, then 
you see it in re-emission, and that's a way that you can use to calibrate you need the formation in the stars. Then you have radio, you have re-emission from each two regions, we have secret re-emission from uh, cosmic rays that are accelerated by supernovae. So if you come to supernovae, basically you have how many new stars you formed over the short time scale before. And then even at X-rays you can use for on the binary star supernovae. Now, why do I use all this? It's because uh, they trace different time scales. So this is something I'm going to come back later on in the context of mean sequence, but roughly you have a good indication of uh, how to convert the UV line into the number of new stars per year. Well, you have to wait on roughly 100 million years when the O and B stars kind of make it to a uh, regime, if you assume, for example, like a constant star position is to be in that time scale. While the gas is immediately ionized, and it's very sensitive to basically O stars, which are short lived and go off as supernova much faster. So, uh, the star formation rate here is over, uh, let's say, 10 million years or less. Dust is much longer, and then radio and X ray, again, if they depend on supernovae or the binaries, they might trace in shorter time. The other point I would like to make is that none of these uh, tracers is, is perfect. They all come with their own. Um, with their own uh, and so the idea is that if we put everything together, then we can have a better idea of what the star formation rate is and how it changes over time, also in short time. The other point I'd like to make about the SCD is that, well, uh, if you go beyond, uh, let's say, one micro here, you start entering the real of uh, the cold stuff. So it's basically dust and gas. Dust is just a minor fraction of the mass of the galaxy, but it contributes a lot to its emission and roughly peaks around, let's say, 100 micron. This is where you can observe these components using far infrared telescopes, or even longer in some millimeter here. Uh, you need, for example, kilometers or interprons. You might have heard of the ALMA telescope in Chile, which is actually able to probe exactly this part here, or even longer, for example, in the VL. And then you go back to radio, which is this, this part out here. Why are these interesting? Uh, because they can tell us something more about galaxies. So we can directly infer uh, the dust, the amount of dust that we have in galaxies. Again, it's not a lot, but it doesn't. And not only it is pretty bright here, but it has another very nagging effect on the SD, which is it eats the blue light. So your galaxies can actually become very faint and very hard to see if you look only at this portion of the spectrum if, if they're very dust. And the dust mass here is particularly sensitive to this portion of the SD called the Rayleigh genes tail. So basically, the first approximation, this thing looks like a modified like body. The peak depends on the temperature. The long wavelength depends instead of how much dust you have. I'll come back to this in a second. And then there's another component, uh, which is visible, or another component, which is gas. We already mentioned ionized gas, it's pretty bright, it's responsible for all those nice lines that you see in the local spectra, and now also crushing eight galaxies spectra. Uh, but then there's also like a colder phase, a colder phase, which is atomic, and then molecular. And why is this important? It is because new stars are born out of this, uh, this kind of, this portion of the gas, this phase of the gas. And this gas is dominated by an electron of hydrogen, H2. But uh, as we will see soon, uh, it's very hard to detect this directly. So we do have to rely on tracers. Once again, the things that we're interested in in terms of physics does depend on uh, our ability to detect that, does depend on how well we understand how it affects the surrounding environment, in this case, the ISN. Uh, we heard from Jeremy uh, mention about uh, uh, molecules like CO, which is a tra uh, classical tracer. Uh, there's something more that we can try to use, uh, some specific atoms like carbon. Uh, dust itself is a good tracer of all gas. Uh, I'll tell you why in a second. And actually, some ultimate measurement can come from dynamics. If you understand the system as a whole, we put in some dark matter, we get rid of the stars because we can measure them uh, with the rest of the SCD here. Then we're left with whatever we have, which is gas. Uh, H1, I'm not going to touch upon this very, uh, in, in very detail, but uh, 
Right now, it's detected up to a shift point punish, maybe one in the stack hundreds of galaxies. But even in this case, it's going to be interesting in the future between SKA, new gigantic interferometer, would be uh, with that interferometer it would be possible to detect H1 to much much higher redshift and include that in the uh, in the variant budget. Bottom line, I hope that at least one thing you can say about from this is that galaxy evolution, also from an observational perspective, is a truly complex problem that spans a lot of different scales. And we do have quite some tools to figure out what's going on, but all of these uh, tracers, all of these probes, they do come with some problems. And I think it's always sobering to keep this in mind. It's not that you have one point you can do, you can solve that solution. We do the best we can. The more we have, the better, obviously. Okay, so quickly, just a few things. Uh, the first one is how to group a galaxy and how we can, uh, how can we reconstruct uh, galaxy properties from the, observ the observations we have. And the first part is about stars. And I think this is probably the core of what uh, your work with was. This is SCD modeling. So we're trying to model again how the light emitted by stars is distributed in some energy space, some wavelength or frequency space. They're all equivalent. And these are the ingredients uh, that we need from uh, this is from uh, review from by uh, Charlie Conway a few years ago. And uh, I'll come back to this, but let me just write them down. Basically, uh, what we need is to know how many stars are formed per, per unit mass uh, from a cloud of gas. We know stars from our molecular cloud, but you can form many uh, low mass stars and a few uh, bright, massive stars. Of course, this can change. It can be probed in the local universe, but there's quite some discussion if this is a universal law. And as you can see here, roughly this is the behavior that I was mentioning. This is a function of mass, and, and this is basically the number of stars, uh, sorry, the number of stars per unit mass that you form in here. It's a little bit like a mass function, basically, which is an initial mass function. And um, you have a lot of low mass stars and a few uh, massive stars. Of course, this you, you can see how this affects your. Uh, estimates of stellar mass and star formation rate, right? Because if you change this number here, you would change your supernova rate, you would change your UV light emission, you would change all of the uh, properties that I mentioned before. So this is a pretty fundamental thing to keep in mind. Then we need to know how stars evolve over time and uh, how they look like. So this is isochronous and, and spectral. And basically, they reply, they reply to this question how are stars distributed in temperature and luminosities? And, and uh, how um, the energy is distributed. So this is basically calibrated against local stars. There are libraries, there are theoretical libraries, there are observed libraries. There are different models that enter the isotopes here. So depending on who you ask, you can put a different ingredient, and of course, the cake will come up different. And what else do we need to make something which looks like a galaxy? Because at the moment, if you put together these three things, you have what is called a single star population. So basically, you're assuming that out of a cloud of gas, you switch on your star formation, and you wait long enough, and you see basically how this single episode of formation uh, produces a star from uh, an SCD as a function of time. But galaxies are not individual bursts of formation. You do need some sort of time evolution, well, you know, they can form stars as a function of time, and this is basically what enters uh, the star formation history ingredient. So basically, we need to know how star formation rate changes as a function of time. The final element here is what I mentioned before, which is dust. Again, it's not a lot, but it does a lot, especially from an observational perspective. And here, is actually shown nicely in this final example here. In blue, you have the intrinsic emission that you would expect. Then you add some dust, and all this blue light here is absorbed, and it's re-emitted here. So you see that the difference is pretty dramatic. And if you don't keep it as a of course, we end up in problems. You cook everything together, and you end up with this composite stellar population, which is building the model that then you can compare with your observations. And then if you have a grid which is broad enough, you can then start mapping properties like the distance of the object, just a shift and a stretch. 
Um, the seller mass, which is basically how many uh, low mass stars you have in your system. And then other things like the start mission rate, you can constrain the start mission history if you leave enough, um, enough variability in there. If you start having spec, you can actually constrain it. And this is what we saw before in the case of a global cluster, Jeremy, age, test extinction, and so on and so forth. But you also see that, I mean, there are quite some choices that one has to make and quite some uh, parameters that you have to try to derive. And we just often end up in problems. We might not have enough information to constrain all the things. But this is something to keep in mind. And there are also quite some degeneracy between all this. On this quantity. So it's a little bit, uh, I mean, it's not, I would say, to try to come up with reliable options of this, uh, all these arguments. And again, keep in mind, you have our own biases in a bunch of these things. And if you don't know your biases, your result here might not be that trustworthy. This is uh, just an example of how basically uh, an SAD would look like. If you just form stars at time zero, and then you just uh, just let it evolve at the function of time, you form stars at the beginning. So you see, this is uh, they have that a very clear shape as a function of wavelength. It looks like a, let's say a power law or less with a bunch of emission lines. These are the lines from the ionized medium. Again, both stars are ionized in the surrounding environments, and then you see that you have different shapes in the function of time. The red, sorry, the blue part here is eroded. And you get more and more stuff that looks like a little bit of a curve shape here until you get this uh, this population, which is as old as the universe, and you lose almost immediately of the lines. Now, this is cool, but again, uh, if you don't have enough information to probe this SED uh, finding, you end up in problems. And often, this is actually a pretty common issue. You have observations in a few bands, and then you have to reconstruct what's going on here. Good luck with that. So, as an observer, uh, again, you may try to come up with something a little bit simplified to start with, which is colors. Colors are nothing else than basically measuring slopes of these various uh, of these various CDs, and they're pretty easy to observe because basically it's your photometric measurements in in at least let's say here three band, just to give an example, like the blue, the green, and the red band. So, colors are ratios of fluxes or differences in magnitudes. And again, this is like observing your galaxy like this and try to make some sense out of it. Again, believe me, this is a more common situation than you might take think of. It's not that you always have your 30 gorgeous, super deep filters, and then you can reconstruct exactly this shape with no problems. So you start with colors, and this is an example of two uh, colors, just because it's going to come back uh, multiple times. And this is just giving you an example of how this color color uh, diagram looks like. So basically, we're trying to measure this slope here and this slope here. So we have, you see that if you have a, what we call a blue galaxy, like power law, this is like it has a clear distinct uh, set of slopes, but then it does change as the galaxy age and so stars. And this is just a collection of how it looks like. Um, so this is just to show how the SCD of the galaxy looks like. And here in the inset, you see how it falls in the, uh, the so-called, in this case, the UVJ diagram. Again, here we're trying to map something which is sorry, shorter of this break, which is an important stellar feature called the Bauman break, and something that happens at longer rates. So that tells you something about the formation of the stars in the blue part, and then that is something about how it's original, how much it is on the long. So you see that you can do a really quite decent amount. And we can certainly distinguish between this thing, which is again like a power law, which is blue. Remember that blue means that the color is low because magnitudes are inverted. Strong. Uh, but we do have something which is much harder to recognize. So these two galaxies have roughly a similar shape. The red slope here is very similar, but they're two very different kinds. The one down here is a galaxy, a galaxy which looks like the Shazen SD, which looks like the one I showed you before. Uh, they're not forming stars. This thing here is probably forming hundreds, if not thousands of stars, and that's because of dust. 
that is eating the blue part and remaining along the wavelength. So here you don't see along the wavelength, but you see the blue part, which is eating. So these two things are very different and they're very hard to distinguish if you don't have them. Uh, this is just a little bit of a future perspective. Unfortunately, I think you did not the reading, but she's been uh, working actively, especially in this, this work in the Cosmos survey. So why should we limit our measurements to only two colors when we have tens of bands in some specific fields? And people have been actually trying to implement machine learning techniques to put everything together and come up with uh, better shapes without putting it once. So this is just measuring slopes all over the place. And this is a couple of examples. This is something called a self-organized and located self-organized. This is a self-organized map and this is something called Disney. So here the axes do not really make a lot of sense in two different terms, but galaxies tend to cluster close to each other if they have similar shapes. But you're not just giving models to your machine learning, you're just giving cutouts and let the machine decide how to organize these objects. So objects that look like similar will be close here in this projection map and similarly here. And you can see that indeed there is quite a smooth variation of the SVs depending on where you are on this, uh, on this time without necessarily having anything meaningful in terms of physics in here. Now, this is going to be the future when you're going to have LSC, you're going to have nuclear, you're going to have billions of guys we have to take care of. And so it's not going to be probably possible to just do a CD modeling for average. So uh, this is going to be a, probably a very fast and reliable way to escape gas problems. Sorry? Yeah? So, which paper is the Arduino Nuts? Is that again? From which of these reference are those nuts? Yeah, sorry. Uh, this one here, uh, TC, is from this designer paper. Okay. Uh, there's quite a literature on that from the same author. I think this is the stat from uh, David's 2022, which I think is the one where Clifton also worked on. And uh, Ben Master 2015 has a pretty good paper that uh, explains how the system, uh, how the mechanism works, okay. and what you actually can do to try to probe the different portions here. Okay. Yeah. Okay. Uh, something quick about cats and dust. Uh, we already mentioned how the FCD looks like at small wavelengths. The first approximation is basically a black body, what you study in your uh, physics uh, 101 with some tweaks. Uh, but the first approximation, again, the peak, the location of this peak tells you something about the temperature once you know the distance of the galaxy, because those two things are completely mixed. If you don't, know, if you don't have an idea of one, it's going to be hard to have an idea of the other. While the long wavelength is sensitive to the dust mass. These are two pretty interesting and fundamental properties of your out dust component. The short wavelength here is actually uh, not dominated, but there's a contribution from stars that are actually coming down this way. If you have an AGN which is obscured, so a black hole in the center of galaxies with some dust around it, it tends to heat up the dust a lot and produce emission here. And then you have also something else which is called pHs, or the cyclic aromatic hydrocarbon. Uh, which are like flat molecules that are also pretty important in terms of the energy and, uh, and what they do in galaxies. I'm not going to go too much into that. Um, and here is that you have the radio emission, which is, again, um, either due to star formation, there's a stinking emission from supernova, uh, or if you have an AGN with some radio jets, this thing can also be boosted up a little. So again, dust is just a tiny component, presumably it's produced by most AGB stars, it's easy to grow, it's just easy to destroy. Uh, it's a like good reservoir of metals. Uh, we celebrated that it's, uh, it's pretty bright, but what uh, is really important in this context is that it's a catalyst for H2 formation, and H2 is the fuel to quark stars. So we need H2 to quark stars, and the easiest, one of the easiest ways to form this thing is to have individual hydrogen atoms being uh, stuck up in some uh, dust grains, and then this uh, facilitates the bonding between the two of them. So you do need some dust to produce enough H2. That's all I want to say about uh, dust. Just keep in mind that, again, peak is the temperature. The integral down below is the total emissivity, which we said depends on the star formation rate, while the long wavelengths are the dust.
And you'll see why now that can be used as a tracer of gas, because you need one, most likely, to point to the other. And the two are actually pretty well made so. But what concerns gas instead? Uh, we said H2 is the most abundant molecule. We cannot directly observe it because it's it's perfectly symmetrical. So it's extremely hard to explain it. You can do that around 500 Kelvin, but the typical temperature of a cloud that forms the stars is like 10 degrees. So that's how really it works. So we have to rely on something else, and we can go for the second most, most abundant molecule, which is carbon monoxide. This thing is not symmetrical. You have carbon and oxygen, so it can uh, vibrate, it can rotate. And actually, it does that in a very uh, easy way. You just need a few Kelvin of temperature to see some emission there. And uh, that's why it's been used widely since uh, several decades. Uh, you do have emission at different um, at different frequencies that reflect different sort of uh, properties of a gas excitation state. You need some very dense and warm gas to excite the high uh, the high JCO transition, while you do need uh, CO in say standard conditions, uh, typical of your general and work class to have CO. And this is how it looks like, and this is uh, what came out of uh, observations with ALMA, which is a powerful spectrometer that actually now allows us to measure this uh, line emission also for very faint normal objects. So this is CO emission in suite one, which probes most of the gas in the galaxy. Something at higher redshift, sorry, at higher J probes those denser and warmer phases. And then this is just to show you that you also have other lines. So in this case, it's a neutral atomic carbon lines, which are also connected with your typical coal interstellar medium, and they can also be used to trace gas. So basically, you can use several methods to try to overcome the degeneracies and the problems of each of the methods, like you could do for stock emission laser, in this case, for the gas mass. Final point of, I think, in this first part is that let's try to piece things together now. I told you how you can measure the stock emission rates, and I told you something about how to uh, measure the gas mass. And do we expect some correlation? Well, yes, right? I mean, stars are born out of coal gas, so to some extent, we do expect that the two quantities go to each other. But how exactly we do that, it's the critical point. And that's because, well, stock emission rates. We have several tracers. I would say is relatively well constrained in the functional emission. This is what you observe from CO. Again, this is what you see with your telescope. The problem is that we need to go from what you see to some physical properties, which is the gas mass. And how you do that depends on some conversion factors. And this is where the problems begin, because it does depend on the properties of galaxy that's dependent on the, on the properties of the gas in the localized regions and so on and so forth. So this is actually a pretty fundamental correlation that was already found uh, several decades ago, 1959. I call the schmidt kenning correlation, but this is just to show you the point of how much your biases can actually result into problematic issues at the end. So let's keep the stock emission rate fixed. It is whatever it is. We use whatever tracer, we trust it. But look at what happens when you use different conversions from the CO observations to the total gas. So if you assume that these galaxies here are different from these galaxies here, and this requires two different conversion factors, obviously the difference is going to be pretty big. If you instead assume something that varies continuously, you do derive only one single relation. And this has pretty profound implications. Because here you would assume that you know galaxies pretty much behave the same way over I would say four or five orders of magnitude in gas mass and stock emission rate. Well, here you're assuming that galaxies do behave differently and they do grow differently. And then when you turn to your simulation, your perfect models, you have to explain why this galaxy is near different from this galaxy is near and why the formation is substantially different. Okay, so I think it's roughly the first uh, 40 minutes. And I think it's a good moment to take like a little break. I think we might need some coffee or some movement and energy. And I can actually take a few questions if you have any at this stage before going into the meeting of the various properties.
if you want to keep your question to mark for later, it's okay. But yeah. Because we guys have done that question now. So either everything is extremely clear or I lost you like it's like one after the two pictures. Okay. Well, if you have any, you can just keep them and ask them later. Otherwise, so that you get it. So the idea of this first part was just to give you a you know a vision of how actually things are done in practice when you plug them in your galaxy evolution models or your cosmology or whatnot. And now it's like we're going more into go more into the meaning of the various relations. So um, yeah, I, I want as I said, I want to spend this first uh, twenty five percent on observations, just because I think it's always useful to know on on what phases a uh, bunch of claims about that solution are actually relying on. And uh, now we're going to take a step forward, which is try to look at how these properties are actually um, correlating with each other, and if we can make some physical sense out of it. And this is when the, the main thing inspires us in productivity. So I showed you this one already. Uh, this was the first attempt, what everyone would do, like an astronomical zoologist would do. You see different shapes, you try to make some sense out of it, and, and group them together. And uh, the work mentioned this sort of implied time evolution between Earth, uh, from early to late time. But actually, we added a lot of information more over the last 100 years connected with this to, let's say, broad categories. And this is just a probably inexhaustive list of how roughly we can uh, distinguish the student set of, uh, of galaxies. So, this is morphology, whatever we mentioned so far. It has some other properties that we've been able to measure the time. The velocity distribution, meaning basically the sizes of these galaxies, how they're concentrated or not. Uh, spheroids are much more concentrated than extended disks. Uh, ages, these things tend to look old when you can measure the stellar ages, while these things tend to look young. If you remember, we said that these things are. Uh, I don't know, that's the next point, sorry. It comes together with the color, this thing tends to be red, this thing tends to be blue. It kind of makes sense now, we said that blue stars tend to be young, so there's a natural association in here. Just have to be careful with dust here, because red not necessarily means gold, as we said. Uh, activity in the sense of how many stars are forming per year. Uh, these are star forming objects, they're alive. These are often referred as red and dead Poisson objects. Stellar masses, they're very massive, very, very massive, almost. I mean, the local universe we have tends to be uh, 12 or more solar masses associated with these objects, they're uh, less massive. Of course, if these are forming stars, they tend to be gas and less rich. This one instead tends to be gas and less poor. I'm pretty going to come back to this uh, obscuration. Well, no gas doesn't be pure. There is some dust obscuration, of course, here. Uh, in terms of kinematics, these things look like Discs, so they tend to be rotationally supported, while this one tends to be pressure dispersion supported, so like random organs, you know, it's also kind of like this sort of elliptical shape. And finally, uh, the environment is also different. These things tend to be your typical massive galaxy at the very bottom of potential ones in clusters or group galaxies, while these things tend to stay a little bit more in the outer. And again, I think it's good to remember that this took us. Well, 100 years, and it took us thousands and thousands of hours of, hours of telescope time, millions of galaxies have been observed, and we still haven't figured it out yet. Otherwise, it wouldn't be here. But. Okay, so, and just an added disclaimer everything correlates with everything. It's uh, the sentence that I hear every time I present something about my sequence quenching or whatever at any single conference. And I think that that's a pretty good description of what's going on. This is just a small subset of scaling relations. Again, everything correlates with everything. Uh, you have on the left the main sequence of star forming galaxies, on which you're going to say something more stellar mass against star formation rate, the two quantities that we spend the first three minutes on. But then you have a bunch of other things. This is the stellar mass function, how galaxies are distributed in function of mass. 
uh, the colors is bracket. So you see that not only you have different scaling relations, but of course the scaling, the scaling relations change as a function of time in an evolving universe. Uh, that are not functions which are divided in quiescent uh, red objects instead of something objects. This is gas fraction, the other quantity that I mentioned. So how much coal gas you have in the galaxy is a function of stellar mass. That's another correlation there. Sizes, mass size relation, and so on and so forth. So everything does correlate with all how, how can we make sense out of this? And there's quite a lot of work that people have been trying to do over the last uh, decades. But uh, let's start with some basics. Uh, chapter one, colors. So basically, again, let's try to start from something which is easily related to observations. And this is something that has been done, I would say, since probably the very beginning. This is a compilation from a great survey, the Sloan Digital Sky Survey, over which a bunch of these correlations have been put on solid rock in the local universe. So here you have your luminosity. Here it's expressed as a petroleum magnitude. But basically, this is bright stuff. This is uh, faint stuff. And this is a color. So if you remember, colors are just some of those slopes that we see there. This is just one color, so it's one slope. It's a blue band, young stars, against a uh, red band, part, which is longer wavelengths, typical as they your uh, low mass. And it was recognized that when they started combining these uh, hundreds of thousands of galaxies, that you do have some the, the galaxies are not distributed uniformly in this plane, but actually they do separate in different, uh, different locations. So you do have a blue cloud and a red sequence and something in between there. So this is the rectic range for those of you who are interested in that. So it's very low for the universe. So let's try to make some sense out of this. This is red. Again, the color that is very high in number is red because of these are magnitudes, so it's always flipped. Uh, and this stuff is blue. There's somehow a settle in between, which is what we call the Green Valley, and this is the, the direction of the luminosity. Now, by now we know that more luminous, more slack fields needs uh, more massive, and this uh, R band. So here you can also read the mass including in this direction. But this is just to show you that indeed it's not a uniform distribution. If you slice this, uh, this emission, sorry, this distribution in the two parameter uh, colors and luminosity, you do see that there is indeed some sort of binomial distribution with something in between. And of course, this changes the function of the luminosity. This is just to show that you know, it is not uniform. So again, luminosity means massive in this band, blue probably is not forming, red either quiet or dusty. At this stage, we still don't know because we, we have to take it dust into account when we do that. Fast forward, uh, this is uh, a version of, again, based on the same SDSF survey in a more recent paper, 2010. So again, you see the, the, the different distribution here between, now it's split, sorry, this is stellar mass. So massive stuff is on this side, red stuff is above, blue stuff is below. And again, you do see that there is a set in between, but not only average is zero. When we start looking at high redshift, you do see that the difference pers persists. So there's still uh, binomials in our distribution between the two. Up to this case, is a redshift lunch. But actually, they've been found up to the highest redshift that we've been uh, looking at so far. A slightly different view of that, just because I showed you that before. Uh, this is the stellar, again, this is uh, magnitude. Now, for some reason, this is split. So again, this is massive. And this is colors, and this is the same separation that I showed you so far. You see that the difference becomes a little bit more subtle, and at some point, almost disappears in high regression. But you do see that this is the distribution when you slice it vertically. But you can see something like that when you look at color colors. So again, this is this is exactly what I was showing you before. You have two slopes now instead of masses. You can paint masses on top. But here, what, is, what I wanted to show you is that you transition from blue stuff down here to red stuff up here. And this is where you have those red things that are not dead, but they're red because of dust. While inside this box, which was designed on purpose, you do find the galaxies that are red because they're dead, because it's red stars. And this is how it changes the function of time. Basically, you depopulate the red 
box, and you get more and more stuff which you have to use. Stop warning. I remove for test. Fast forward, why do you think that happened? Well, we said that the original early type galaxies, red and dead, to late type galaxies, evolution is actually the opposite. And here, what you're seeing is a function of redshift is actually blue galaxies that are becoming more and more dead and white. So, this is an effect of cancer evolution. This is another version in the uh, in the local universe. Uh, it's a very cool project called Galaxy Zoo. So actually, citizens have been looking at thousands of images and trying to distinguish early type from late type galaxies. It's a great example of how to involve everyone in the process of science. So this is basically what I've shown you before. Again, from uh, local universe, as it sounds like. Uh, this is massive galaxies. This is U minus R. Now we know it is a red and dead. And these are like blue uh, objects. But these are split now uh, as a function of the morphology. So this thing looks like early type, and this thing looks like late. And you see that what we call green values, so the, the hole here, the sun in between, actually changes when you look at the morphology. It looks like here there's probably a green value, so there's no other galaxy, you know, just some blue or the type. But when you look at the blue galaxies, sorry, at the late type galaxies, the, the majority, which is blue, but you also have quite a lot of late type projects that are red in the local universe. So here it looks like there's no, no green value. And, and actually, since we you know, we're a nice spot that we know that we go from blue to red in terms of galaxy evolution, this is telling us something about how quickly <laughs> galaxies that look like early type ended up being early type red from early type blue, and how slowly this happened for this part. This is the process of shutting down the star formation, which is for the quench. I'm going to come back to this later. But again, this is to remind that depending on what you look at and how you look at it, the results are pretty different. If you stop at this point, which is what I was showing you at the very beginning, you would have just concluded that everything transitioned fast from here to here. Actually, this is not the case. It just depends on something which is behind the ontology. And these blue things, uh, according to the paper, this is the Shavinsky paper, uh, is main sequence star forming galaxies. So it's about time to jump into this main sequence. So the main sequence, which uh, is just a name that was uh, invented when this correlation is found, uh, is the correlation between the stellar mass of the galaxy and the star formation. So these are the two quantities that. I was trying to introduce in the first part. So this is again from SDSS, so low barrier of galaxies. And you do see that there's a pretty good correlation between the two. It's relatively tight, you say 0 0.2, 0 0.3 dex, so in the rhythmic space, actually, to which to the bridge. And it's approximately linear. So there might be something happening at these large masses. I'll come back to this in a second. But it's pretty remarkable that, again, you have several orders of magnitude here and here. And the correlation stays there. So galaxies, star forming galaxies that follow this correlation are called main sequence galaxies. Here, notice that there's not a lot of stuff above and below. You see that in a minute. This is the same sort of view. This is SDSS, so it's the same sort of data set. But now this is showing it in 3D. And it's not getting rid of the red. Things. So this is star formation rate, stellar mass, and you do see the correlation there. But it's basically linear. But now here to show you how many galaxies are falling on this correlation. And you see that there are pretty uh, pretty straight lines that the star formation is all in this part, and this is the standard of red galaxy. And you can see it even better when you try again to the project. So this is again the same sort of uh, well. This is your big sequence of star forming galaxies. And then you have a cloud of red objects here, which have low star formation rate for the set of mass typical of a main sequence galaxy. And then you have another sort of red cloud down here, which is actually pretty much connected with this object here. Again, if you remember what I showed you before in terms of Green Valley, people would roughly refer to Green Valley whatever is in between these two clouds, but the definition is not that clear in this stop maturing cloud mass plane. Or better, there is a pretty dearth of object here. 
but galaxies that are transitioning at the time of observation are pretty much floating in between. So, this can... so again, we move from colors to something a bit more physical, star formation radiance analysis. And we will try to make sense of why we have this correlation, why is it this broad, and why what is the reason why this thing at some point turned out to be red and correct. This is the same view of the stock formation main sequence, but now this peak is much, much more evident if you weight the number of galaxies by the stock formation. So basically, this is telling you where the stock formation rate is happening when you look at the rest of the data class. Stock formation rates, stellar masses, fine, but now you weight it by how many stars are formed in your unit. And clearly, there's a peak that comes up here. And notice that there is no bending here. That's because we're not including somehow or we're downweighting all the objects that are somehow on this way on their way down or are a little bit biased. But interestingly, if you wait it by this, oh, it's the next step, sorry. This is just to show you uh, how it looks like when you slice it. So this is the star formation rate that you slice at some specific solar mass. So in this direction. I think it's at the 10.5 here. Yes. So this is weighted by number, and you do see the double distribution. But then when you weight it by a stock emission rate, clearly they're destroyed. It's not a pure Gaussian peak. I mean, you see the dark statements. That tells you that there is some, some stock emission rate that is going on in low, uh, and that's a low stock emission rate. And there is actually a tail here where you have, for the fixed stellar mass, huge stock emission rates. So there's passive objects that are well above the base. This is instead what I was referring to when you weight it by stellar mass. The picture is pretty much inverted. You know, so these things are forming most of the stars now, but they do not contain most of the stars are in the red or it's uh, at least efficiency. So I think it was a very nice version to show how the various properties are correlating and, and what we're talking about when you say, hey, I have a main sequence galaxy, what is the typical star formation is, what is the typical star mass? Cool thing is that if you look at higher chips, uh, the relation is still there. So it looks like some sort of a fundamental relation in here, in some sense. So these are just two versions of two very nice and high sided papers. Uh, the plot is always the same, so that I must have mission rates. You do see that the slope stays roughly the same, but what changes is the uh, normalization. And normalization involves like 1 plus e to the power of. So the like that. That we think is that the scatter around the relation is also pretty constant, which is something uh, we're trying to figure out. So this relation exists, exists at any rational we observe so far. It was a paper today claiming that we could see some great sequence rate from JWST or Russia 7 and 9. So that's the big jump. The highest pressure here is Russia uh, 3 or 4, I think. So you see that now we have possibilities to do that in a much higher pressure. The scatter doesn't change. What changes is the normalization. So galaxies that fix stellar mass and higher redshift, as they appear, were forming way more stars than galaxies that fix stellar mass. This is another version. You do see a little bit of bending here, and large masses and lower uh, redshift, which is interpreted as either some selection effects. If you include some of the galaxies that are down here that are not very stuff forming in this selection, then of course you can do flatten, or to the effect of these things are really shooting down, so they're they're getting points. Okay, so these are the basic things that I wanted to mention about the main sequence. What happens above the main sequence? We already saw what happens below the main sequence. These are facts that are not forming the main stars. What happens above? Well, this is what we call star distance. So galaxies that are fixed stars, they do form way more stars than the typical gas galaxy formation. Interestingly, they're not that many, they're just very few percents, which you know, follows the idea that these are outliers, they're not going to be the galaxy. And they contribute to something like 10% of the total star emission rates that you see here. This is a result that uh, is pretty, pretty important, it came out in 2011, this paper by Julia Rubinier. And it was possible because we started seeing that these crazy things that are very dust rich using telescopes that allowed us to look at tests directly. In this case, it was the Herschel um, telescope. 
and that's we said the good growth of cybersecurity. So cybers, they might be very interesting, and uh, towards the end I'll uh, try to say why. But they're not your typical object, and they're not very numerous or extremely um, extremely important in terms of uh, the budget. At this time. Okay. What about the gas mass now? So we started from the colors, the stars. Then we jumped into some more physical properties, stellar mass and star formation rate. But now we know that you know, stars are falling out of gas, so we do expect some correlation with the star formation rate and, and the stellar mass. And this is the exact same block that I showed you before, but now I painted some names in here. Uh, these are your main sequence galaxies, typical objects that follow the correlation. And these things here look more like star researchers. So crazy, luminous, uh, dusty, star forming galaxies. These are again the observations. And this is what happens when you assume different conversion factors to the idea of gas masses. So this relation now, well, it has a name. It is this Schmidt Kennedy relation. Again, it was found for local galaxies very back in the day, 1959. And then there's this seminal paper by Kennedy in 1998 that put together things. This relation is not linear, it's something like 1.4. Sorry, this is expressed in terms of surface densities, but they're a little bit interchangeable somehow. Uh, this is a bit more physical because it's connected to the local density of the galaxy, the gas and stuff in the galaxy. While if you integrate this over the projected uh, then the projected size of the objects in the sky, you do have basically stuff in the and gas. That's it. And uh, it's not linear, something like uh, uh, to the power of 1.4. Gas here is molecular. Uh, there are also versions with H1, but I focus on this one with H2. And basically, again, this is telling you how a, a parcel of gas is converted into stars, how efficient. And often the ratio between these two quantities, or the integrated version, is referred as an efficiency. It's not a proper efficiency, it has a unit of uh, time to the minus one. So if you take the inversion of this one, uh, which it, it's a time scale. It's a time scale that uh, tells you how, you say, how much time you need to form stars out of the pocket of gas. So the slope is a pretty critical uh, point here because, as we mentioned to some of you before, uh, star formation is somehow a, a local process, right? You need your cloud of gas, it has to collapse, and that form stars. And basically, that is set by those local. Uh, Local processes. So, depending on how you assume that your star formation is regulated or how your star formation is going on in your clouds, you do get different results with these slopes. And actually, this is a pretty part of the test. For in simulation, often this is assumed the other way around. You assume that it exists. You cannot really trace the star formation rate to the lowest uh, temperature to the highest uh, gas density. So, when you know, you're at the limit of your resolution, you reach some density threshold, then you assume that the galaxy forms stars with some sort of stuff. So it is a pretty powerful and pretty important relation here. And again, it's just telling us something about how much star formation rate you can form out of gas. And if you do have different relations, then that could be a pretty substantial difference with respect to having a one unique universal law. Okay, so this drives me into this uh, main questions. Uh, what does it mean that the majority of galaxies are on the main sequence on this correlation as the one last time we Are star bursting galaxies are higher? Uh, are they completely different from main sequence galaxies? And how do galaxies drop out of the main sequence? So, this is uh, probably a good moment to uh, stop and hear some questions if you have any. And then uh, well, tomorrow we're going to jump into the meaning of the main sequence, sky, and how to access. Thank you. Thank you. So, um, I know that you have some questions uh, between, uh, between the lecture, <laughs> between, but uh, if you have more questions, then it's a good, good moment.
too much observations. <laughs> not enough physics. But if you don't, if you don't have questions, I'm happy to go forward and show some more things. But please. Um, <laughs> So it was a very interesting question. So uh, this correlation which we saw, uh, it is is it for normal galaxies or for all galaxies? I need a this galaxies consist active galactic nuclei or no? Yeah, well, that's actually one of the problems because depending on what you put in your selection, you might get different results. Uh, overall, I would say that it stays there. So you do have galaxies with some Asian in there, especially the dusty things where it probably has dust and pure objects. Uh, we do have those Asian, actually, there are not in star forming galaxies, right? We know that you know, radio galaxies might not be. Even. Strongly star forming, and we do have galaxies in the Green Valley. Towards the end, I'll try to go quickly through that because one of the ideas of why galaxies go from the main sequence to the S is due to AGN activity. So maybe the AGN do have an effect on why this idea. So um, the next question maybe is. Plenty of time for us. How do you think? Uh, how big might be influence of the AGN to the star formation rate of the galaxy? Uh, from an observational perspective or physics? You think that there's a connection between AGN yeah. and the... it, Yeah. Okay. Okay, let me start from an observational perspective. I think that what well, AGN is notoriously uh, problem if you want to estimate star formation rates because it emits in your UV part, it emits in your medium infrared part, and it emits in your radio part and X-rays. So there's always some contribution. So whatever you measure in terms of star formation rates, it might be an upper limit if there's some contribution of the AGN to the emission. Now establishing a physical connection, that's a little bit more controversial, I would say. Uh, there are propositions a positive effect, which I guess might be what you think. So some, maybe some uh, jet activity compressing the gas, generating some star formation, could be portion of or this uh, gas. I think there are some documented cases. It's hard, I think, to find because of the other possible correlations there. I think that most of Mm, let's say a sort of astronomers tend to believe that the effect is the opposite. So you get rid of star formation rate because of the agent activity, the agent just blows out the gas, no gas, no star formation, or warm gas, no star formation. But yeah, I mean, there are works that try to do that. So I also have one more question. <laughs> Please. Okay, yeah. Okay. Uh... If we speak about the gen, uh, do you saw new image uh, from Yerizita uh, for our Fermi bubbles in our galaxies? So now uh, we have uh, two different uh, ideas of why we have these Fermi bubbles in our galaxies. One that is maybe our central part, our supermassive black hole was active. In the Pacific, and this is a result of some jet, yeah? or maybe it's due to very active star forming. Uh, how do you think? Can we observe something similar uh, in another basic galaxies now? Um, so, first, I'm not a high energy astrophysicist, so. Apologies if uh, it's not going to be very detailed, but again, distinguishing the two contribution would be somehow, I think, hard. I don't know if there's maybe something in the geometry there. I mean, whatever you blow out, if it says a spherical symmetry, then it's very complicated. I guess that maybe some 
some slope of the emission that could be different you know, depending on whatever uh, field you have in terms of energy you can give more or less uh, steeper or, or uh, shallower um, emission but for passive galaxies um, it's already extremely hard to measure stop emission rates that's I don't know if you can actually go there and get some detailed physical you know, extension to say what is what. There are some special cases, like galaxies in the order of massive clusters. So you do have X-ray emission from a cluster, and then often you do see that there are models in there. It's actually on a much larger scale, we're talking about clusters. And people do think it's due to the AGM activity at that point, right? because that should be the only thing that allows you to draw this huge wire bubbles and, uh, and push out. So these are actually observed by x These things are not your prototypical probably bias an object, but they're at the bottom of clusters and they do have some activity, cyclical activity. But you can see some effects like that, at least from AGN. I'm not aware if people associate with those things that Thank sure you. Hello, thank you for the nice talk. I have one question. Because when you were showing the, the color color diagrams for the main sequence, they were showing the upper part where the like less star probably galaxies were located. But when you were showing the star formation drive versus the mass, they were in the other, they were like near bottom, right? So what why why is that? Or or maybe I got confused. This one? Uh, maybe like most in the beginning when you were showing the, the color color. Why did you stop me? Before? It must be before, yes, yes, yes. Much before. Yeah. So it doesn't be like the, the, the second plot, but. Uh, uh, yeah, and just the. That one, yes. It's fine. Am I getting very confused? Or like, uh, is it when you compare this one with the one with the star formation, are in the early time, like yeah. the lower part? Or. Uh, it's, yeah, so call, you're referring to colors versus star formation rate? Yes. Yes. So, well, stellar mass is the same, right? So, mass yeah. and things are all the same. So, colors, uh, U minus R, red things end up in the top part, and blue things end up in the bottom part. That's just the definition of colors, right? It's minus 2 by 5 log of other than. So, that's, that's why it's flipped. But so if you think about the meaning of what you're tracing here, uh, this is the regression zero. So U is like what's 0.3 nanometers, 30 600, some, something that's just like optical blue, probably. as blue as you can get in the, from, from the graph. While R is a uh, much longer wavelength. So let's say, I don't know if it was uh, 7,000 years, something like that, but much better. So it means that basically you're you're taking something which is sensitive to blue stars, which are notoriously the OB stars, typically the stars. So these things have to be starting. So your start emission rate for it to you being blue. So going down. While the quiescence goes the other way around. I think I put the arrows here. What? Well, this one is the same. But this is exactly the one you will do. This is mass, so red goes up and blue goes down. So these are star forming, and this are um, quiescent for the time being. You might have some dust in there, the but those things are just um, integrators. You don't, you don't want them there. You should bring them back. So, yeah, does that answer your question? Yes. <laughs> Hello, thank you for a very nice talk. It was a good, uh, I think, talk. And I have one question that we see that there are some uh, blue elliptical galaxies also detected and red spiral galaxies detected. So those galaxies will be in the green valley, which are like transitioning? Um, so by color definition, yes, right? You define green valley, whatever is in between red and blue. A lot of fantasy by strong but here the point is that 
when you have everything together, obviously the state is density contours are tracing truly this peak and this peak, and this thing looks pretty much depopulated. So why people that's the reason why people say Green Valley, it's a bottom, right? So if you slice it vertically, there's a deep in between. When you think that in terms of morphology, and as we said, morphology actually correlates with a bunch of things with those lists. So it's not that morphology necessarily drives the transition, it's just correlating with the transition. Probably something that is responsible for the change of morphology is also responsible for the change in colors. The things change, right? I mean, here is true, it's a truly depopulated green area. We have very few of this blue, which are down here, very tiny. But as you see here, there's quite a lot of this stuff. And it's a bit hard to define a valley, right? It's, it's just like something with a tail that that goes. So, I mean, maybe I'm wrong, but that valley is so fetching that it is. Okay, well, we're getting a lot of questions about this. Um, uh, let me just pull up these lines. Since we're here, uh, more is going to be less about this. So we can jump through this. Let's see. Let's see. Let's see. But this is the same slide. Right. So it isn't just slicing it in other ways, it is related with French. And I think what is interesting here is that, again, so this is big in very tight and very tight. So my apologies is a little bit. But now the vertical columns is halo masses. So this is stuff which is in low mass halos. Low mass means below the center This is stuff which is in high mass halos above the center Let's say that a group or a cluster in local universe is group is tended to be very teenish, cluster is tended to be teen number. And you see that the early types are pretty much similar. And all the red, no, the bluish or green valley are actually in the low mass halos. The blue type actually, the, the link type actually changes pretty much. So you do have this, you lose almost all the tail plus stuff that goes up here. While most of this prototypical green type of getting red link type are going up here. So this is probably a more fundamental way to distinguish these things. And the reason why they're different when it's split in early and late is probably on how fast quenching is. Now, we said that blue is performing red squares. From one to the other is shutting down something, quenching something. If you're very fast, you find very few galaxies in transition, right? But this is just telling us that most of the early split transitioned quite some time ago, probably, and whatever is transitioning now is happening in the low mass scales. All the stuff is already red and dead and quite in here in this early time in the cluster. <coughs> Indeed, when you take a picture of a cluster, those things in the center, they all look like spheroidal ish and all red and basically all of them, they're not from the same. Well, here is just telling you that the blue things, the upcoming stars, are in the low mass halos, which is what I was telling before. And the ones that are in the massive halos, so spirals, in your clusters, they're actually transitioning up. How fast? Well, slow, right? Because you do find a lot of them here. If you want, you can convert the density of this point, number density, into a time scale. The faster you are, the less galaxy you find. So this is to be a fast quenching for this early things. And we have to come up with an explanation of why the method yellows, why fast. And why are the type? Why did it change the morphology? I guess that what the JNA is going to show, show something tomorrow. Why this thing is slow. And to figure out why there's this sort of pressure in there. And if this is the same in a rush, because obviously a rush is five, there's no slow things, right? Everything is very fast. Because the time, the age of the universe is one of the years. So there's no slow things. So it is connected with. Question and but how fast quenching is, and that should tell us something about why. Okay. 